Uh, clean fuel can mean longer combustion for your engine, longer life, or it can mean non-unplanned uh, maintenance on a backup generator. Uh, we don't want to go down in a mission critical facility. Hospitals and data centers, it's important they have backup fuel and that we don't uh, have a power outage and lose the entire uh, power grid there. Okay, so AXI, uh, as I gave in the last presentation, we're an A-plus rated business with the Better Business Bureau, and we build custom manufacture, engineer, uh, fuel management solutions. What that means is we, we make systems that will clean your fuel, will maintain your fuel, will transfer your fuel, uh, temporary storage, anything that's integrated with your big fuel tank and how to get fuel to your generator. Uh, that's very important for us and where we specialize. Okay, so the markets we serve, and I guess you guys as well, our mission critical is a very large one for us. A lot of backup fuel. We see the biggest problems in backup fuel, so that's, that's normally our, our biggest one. Agriculture, government, power generation, transport, marine, mining, military, basically wherever fuel is used or stored. Uh, storing being the more critical one as it breaks down over time. Now, you can see here, this is just a glimpse of some of the companies that we do business with. Uh, in the U.S. and in all international markets, we are not a service company. We are not an installation company. So we like to partner with facilities and businesses like yourself uh, so that you can find the end customer and you do the service. Uh, so that's why we enjoy partnering with people like you, uh, engine distributors, engine resellers, anyone that has the capability and the staff on site to be able to perform the installation, integration, commissioning. Uh, we're not out there. So we thank you guys for that. All right, so the products we have, like I mentioned, I gave you an overview of what we have and what we do and how we integrate into a fuel system. But we have enclosed fuel polishing systems. We have ones that are on back plates. We have mobile ones where we get into remediation instead of maintenance. And we have passive ones. So if they already have submersible pumps or pumps on site, we can tie our system in without giving them pumps so they can just push through our system. Uh, then we get into the fuel transfer, day tanks. So these are temporary storage or close to the gen set storage and then transferring from a bulk tank to the smaller tank uh, for runtime. Then we have additives. We always like to push the additives because you can't complete everything with a fuel system. Um, additives are good for belly tanks or tanks that have a lot of baffle walls on the inside. If the fuel can't recirculate and it's hitting a lot of walls, AFC is gonna help uh, clean those walls, disperse some of the uh, sludge, and keep the fuel in good condition. And newly released, we have laser particle counters. So that's a way for you to, in the field, quantify how dirty your fuel is. These are becoming very important and they're becoming a large interest internationally so that you can take two samples of fuel from different areas and you can basically compare them uh, using a number based system. That's going to give you an idea. And here in the US, uh, big distributors, CAD, Cummins, uh, the big guys, they're putting qualifications for their fuel or, or quantified numbers in their OEM specs that the fuel needs to meet for these to be in warranty. So they can actually void your warranty here in the US if your fuel is out of spec, and they will test that, so that's important. And then obviously we have fuel testing and sampling. Uh, this is very important for your end, especially when you're selling. If you can show a test or a sample to the customer, uh, usually your chances of getting a job or installing a system are much greater. If you can prove that they have bad fuel, uh, everyone loves a visual sample, so this is very important, especially making the sale and closing the sale. Okay, so like I mentioned before, first here we have is enclosed systems. These are NEMA 4 rated. These are for outdoor use. Um, they have a large similarity compared to the systems down here, but basically the difference between these is, like I said, outdoor use, indoor use, or inside the gen set enclosure. So if you guys have someone that fabricates gen set enclosures, uh, these are a very popular solution here in the US. We have a controller that can mount within eight feet of the unit. So if they have space issues or they need to mount in a tight corner, uh, they mount the system wherever they can near the fuel tank and the controller can be put somewhere else so that they can access it. Then we have the mobile systems. These two here are a part of our MTC line. Uh, this is a two skid system and this is a hand cart based system. The smaller systems we call the MTC series. The larger systems are the MTC HC series where the HC stands for high capacity. These systems can go up to 150 gallons per minute. I think it's just under 600 uh, liters per minute. And then this one here is 25 gallons per minute or just under 100 liters per minute. Now, these are bacon bombs or sample thieves or tank samplers. Uh, what these are, these are stainless steel and you put them on a rod, you drop them to the bottom of the tank or anywhere in the tank. And it allows you to open up a, basically a valve and that's gonna store a sample inside the, the bacon bomb. So when you pull it back out, you can take that sample 
And lot, that allows you to give you a profile of how dirty the tank is as you move towards the bottom. So if you want to get the customer a sample from the top, the midpoint, and the bottom, uh, normally we find the most problems at the bottom, but everyone likes to think the top of the fuel is very clean too. Sometimes we see that's not the case. And then down here, these are our transfer systems. Now, in mission critical facilities, we have, uh, you can see there's two pumps on this system. What this does, this transfers fuel from a bulk storage tank to a temporary days tank that the engine is actually gonna pull from. Now, these systems are considered mission critical and they have two pumps and two of basically everything in the system. So the first time that system transfers fuel from the main tank to the day tank, it's gonna use pump one. The next time it's gonna use pump two. And that way you get even wear on both pumps and one doesn't burn out before the other. Uh, and that also gives you the ability that if one of the pumps fails at any time during a transfer, pump two can kick on immediately. So it's a redundant way to transfer fuel from one tank to another. And we see these are very popular everywhere in the US is using now uh, duplex pumping systems, what we call them. And then you can see the AFC here. Uh, this you can get more information on how this works. Uh, the chemical is a little different than the product line. And here we have uh, integrated day tank. So these have PLC based controllers. You can see here there's two pumps as well. On a day tank, we either put the pump set like this on the day tank, which you can see here, or they'll just have a return pump. Uh, the return pump, basically that day tank is gonna overflow. It pushes the fuel out of that day tank back to the main tank. So these are more into the transfer and we can give additional lessons on those. Uh, today I'm mostly gonna focus on the fuel polishing and the, the fuel cleaning aspect. So you can see here we have examples of STS systems. Um, now we size these and we'll help size these, size these for you guys uh, based on how big the tank is, what the volume turnover is in the tank, how often do they take on fuel, and then when maintenance is on site. Uh, so we can craft these. They have seven day timers in them, so they can program three timers per day. So if you wanna run from eight to 10 in the morning, and then from one to three, and then from four to five, normally we just say that you wanna run while your maintenance staff is on site. So if one of these systems goes down, you get an alarm on the exterior, you have someone on site, they can go out, they can change the filter, they can clean a filter out, they can check the system. Now these particular systems you see here, all of our systems are continuous duty, all the STS and FPS line. So these systems have been running 24 hours a day, seven days a week for, uh, I think it's been years now. So everything is capable of running longer than uh, the, lead, the lag time or the lag time that we say we'd normally run them for. Uh, our recommendation for your customers is, you wanna be able to turn the entire volume of your tank over in a 48 hour period, and then you wanna split that 48 hour period up over a week. If it's five days a week and you do eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, and you get 40, that's probably okay. If your customer has a budgetary issue and they can't afford the certain system you're recommending, there is the option where you can take a smaller system and run it more hours. So like this customer here didn't wanna pay for the upgraded system, they bought the smaller system, but they run it 24 hours a day. And that way you've satisfied their budget needs and they get the fuel filtration system. The FPS systems, these are basically the same thing as the STS, except these are originated in the marine industry. So they were made for the engine rooms of boats that were very tight uh, with the space. This unit could be mounted on the wall and the controller could be somewhere else, maybe near the door so they could access it without going all the way into the engine room. These have become very popular now within the uh, enclosures of gensets now. So when you get packaged gensets and they have a belly tank and then you get an enclosure around them, we see that these are the, the favorite solution. It's cheaper than putting the covered system in exterior to the, to the actual outside enclosure. So these are a very popular solution for that. So inside genset enclosures, if it's an inside install and they don't need to have a lockable closure, these are really good. Now the mobile fuel polishing, uh, I'll mention this, I've mentioned this before, I guess in Diesel 101, whoever was present during that uh, presentation. We look at fuel polishing and fuel cleaning from two different aspects. There's fuel maintenance, where you're, you're getting clean fuel and you wanna keep that fuel clean by recirculating it using a stationary system. And then we also have mobile systems. So these are systems that if the fuel tank has been sitting for eight months and there's a lot of buildup and sludge, um, and you wanna go in, you wanna clean that tank, and get it back up to spec, you want to use a mobile system. Typically with a mobile application, we go much higher flow rate. We want to really stir up the tank and try to remove a lot of the stuff from the sidewalls. Uh, and then normally we'll use an AFC as well too, so you can kind of break down the stuff that's already stuck to the tank. Now, the STS systems and the FPS systems, they can remove a lot of the sludge that's on the bottom of the tank, but these have economical solutions by using bag filters. So what's easier is if your tank's really bad, you use a mobile system, 
You go in, you use bag filters, you remove a lot of the big sludge instead of using the very expensive spin-on filters uh, like you see in the STS systems. Those are for keeping your fuel very clean um, and you don't want to waste through a lot of those where these are a better solution if the fuel is already bad. Or as part of your service arm, if you want to go out and clean the tank before installation of an STS or an M FPS, you want to get an MTC type system. Uh, FTS, I'll breeze through this one again. Basically, this is the duplexing. You can see the smaller pump is, or the other secondary pump is lower here, but there's two pumps. We have two strainers for each pump. You have two pressure switches. Basically, like I said, redundant everything with a relief valve. So if this line gets too pressurized, the fuel goes back to the main tank. Uh, so there's no chance of exploding any piping or anything like that. Uh, dual vacuum switches, dual flow switches. Uh, this makes sure that if anything goes wrong, uh, one the other pump can take over and cover for it. So the day tanks along the same line, these are double wall tanks. We sell what are UL uh, 142 tanks. That means there's one tank basically welded inside the other tank. So if the interior tank ever has a leak, it leaks into the secondary tank. And we have a float switch in there that'll shut the tank down, shut the whole system down so that you don't uh, continue leaking. And these can be equipped, like I said, with a pump set. Uh, we have PLC controllers. Most of our systems have the ability or we can upgrade it to the ability so that you can uh, connect to a BMS, you can have ethernet. You guys all right? <laughs> all right, perfect, all right. So day tanks, we can get into, like I said, if you need another presentation on that and you see the need for these, we'll, we'll get a little further into those. AFC, uh, the three different AFC blends you're gonna see is basically 705, this product we've had for a number of years. 705 was great for older engines. If there's a little bit of water in your tank down in the bottom and it's separated out, what 705 is gonna do is it's gonna mix the water up into the fuel and emulsify it. Uh, if your engine is a newer engine, a tier four engine with high injection pressures, very sensitive injectors, you probably wanna go with the AFC 7010. Now the 710 does not have uh, the surfactant component, that's the component that pulls the water into the fuel and keeps it into small, small droplets and keeps it dispersed throughout the fuel. So 705 for older engines or if you want to pull the water into the fuel, 710 for newer engines if you have high injection pressures, high pressure common rail, go with the 710. The 805 is a blend, I know the number makes doesn't make a ton of sense, but the 805 is a blend of the 710 with an anti-gel. So if you have very cold temperatures, basically, uh, like diesel 101, the larger, longer hydrocarbon particles, they don't slide very well past each other. Uh, they stick and then they drop out and you can see a white haze and that's basically the wax is coming out of solution. 805 will keep those waxes in solution and it lowers the pore point or the cloud point of the fuel by around 25 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're having cold flow issues and the fuel isn't moving very well, uh, 805 is a very good solution with that along with the same benefits that you get from 710. Now, we, we say that uh, fuel sampling and testing is always the first step. You always wanna know what's wrong with the fuel. Um, and we, we can walk your customer through basically um, like a four-step process in terms of checking their fuel. The first thing you tell the customer is, do you have bad fuel? They say, no. You go and you tell them, go check your fuel. They open the tank up, they take a little scoop maybe, they look at it and they say, my fuel is clean. But we know, since we've been in the fuel industry for a while, that if you let fuel sit, basically your dirtier fuel starts to sink and it starts to agglomerate on the bottom of the tank. So that's where you're gonna find your worst fuel. So that's where you can sell, or step two would be to sell them a bacon bomb or something they can test uh, the bottom sample of fuel. So something to get them down and to get a sample, they can see really what's at the bottom of that tank. If that's not convincing enough, the particle counter we mentioned is a way to show them the cleanliness of their fuel uh, via numbers and they can compare that to what the engine's supposed to have in their OEM manual. Now, if they don't make that connection, well, you can send it to a lab. Now, lab is gonna give you the same kind of a cleanliness code or cleanliness ratio that you're gonna get from a particle counter. Uh, what a lab test is also gonna do is it's gonna give you chemical characteristics of the fuel. When we talk about fuel polishing and fuel cleaning, we don't change the chemistry of the fuel in any way. Even adding an additive, the fuel stays the same. Uh, we don't do anything like a refinery does by breaking down the fuel. So basically what you, you have in a lab test is you'll see how clean the fuel is. You'll also see what's the cetane level, what are the chemical characteristics of the distillation, uh, is this fuel heavier than it should be, is it good in cold weather. So if they really want to investigate the problem of the fuel, then you'll want to go to a lab test. 
And then uh, once again, I mentioned this briefly, if there's a customer that has a certain need, uh, every customer needs something different and they all want something uh, that isn't the same. We do a lot of custom solutions here. So we have the ability, we do three-dimensional CAD. We can, if you give us layouts and plan view drawings, we go through those all the time. Uh, we can design something that fits your needs and your customer's needs. Uh, you can see here, we've got a few different solutions, basically systems that are on trailers with skids and we've got mobile fuel polishing trailers we build all the time. Uh, so really, if there's a need and you want to work with us on that, that's why we're here to support you guys, your customer. Filters and vessels, we keep in stock most filters and vessels. Uh, as you start to sell more systems and you develop your own clientele base, it's a good idea to start stocking these types of items uh, so they're available and on site very quickly. Now, we have a variety of these, even ones that aren't uh, involved with most of our systems or our legacy products. So we have access to order all these kind of things and we get OEM discounts. So if you guys need uh, anything custom or you're requiring some type of filter that we don't have in stock, just let us know and we'll see what we can do. So like I mentioned, the two ways the different systems work, the mobile side and the maintenance side, uh, they're kind of the same. We do a kidney loop. You wanna have the inlet of your system come from one end of the tank and you want to have your return go to the other end of the tank. And that basically creates a loop where the fuel comes up and sweeps along the bottom of the tank and pushes any grime, sludge, muck into the suction side of the system so it can be removed. Um, the real big difference, like I said, is flow rate. So you can see here, this system is 150 gallons per minute, 950 liters per minute, where this one's four gallons per minute. So this one's going to maintain that fuel. If you continue to remove the water uh, on a long-term basis, you're not going to lead to microbial growth. You're not going to have rust build up from uh, rust or corrosion of your tank. So this one is going to keep your tank clean and keep the water out of there at all times. This is basically you've got a problem and you need to fix it. So then we install that after. So this was just a quick sales pitch. I'm going to unmute the microphone real quick so you guys can give me com comments, questions, anything you have, and then we'll go into more of the integration and a little bit more details on the STS line. Thank you. Any questions? How's our video quality and audio quality still? Are we okay? Yeah, we're, we're, I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay, great. Then I'm just going to move into the next one and uh, we'll do a longer question session at the end if you have them. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. We're going to mute you again real quick. Just raise your hand if there's any questions or anything. Um, I'll stop. Okay, now this presentation, STS Systems, Features and Integration. This goes through the STS product line, but the FPS product line is very similar. Uh, a few minor changes, but not enough that we need to create an entire presentation for this. Um, we can go into detail more with this green screen effect that we have here. We can also go into more detail. If you have specific questions and you want us to throw a slide up here, uh, anytime really, we can set up a slide and I can walk through any of the, the technical details with you guys. Okay, so we've, we've seen this slide before in the last one. You know who we are. I'm going to pass that one real quick. Uh, STS, we're going to go through the maintenance overview of the systems. We're going to look through installation and setup, pump vacuum and system capabilities. We're going to look briefly at the controllers in these systems. We'll take a look at some of the system specifications. Most of this stuff is included on the website and within any of our, uh, our brochures or any of that, so we'll, we'll go through that. We'll look at alarms and commissioning because this is another way for you to make revenue. And then we'll look at some options that your customer can get if they're requiring anything. So here we're going to go into the maintenance overview of the whole system and how this all works. Okay, this is going to be available for your reference. We'll give you this PowerPoint. This is kind of a chart that will help you size as well too. This one isn't as clear, I don't think, as the other images. But it's going to give you an idea of basically which system you're specifying, the flow rate, the flow rate, how many gallons that's going to turn over at a certain period, and then it's going to give you basically the size tank that we would normally recommend. If you have questions or you want us to help with your sizing, um, that's fine. We can help you out. Just let us know the specifications or give us a plan about drawing or anything you have, really. And then here's the recommended suction and um, return size plumbing you want to have on these systems. You'll notice that we always upsize the suction plumbing, and I'm going to really harp on that in this uh, presentation, and that's because pump, pumps only have a certain capability when it comes to pulling a vacuum or pulling fluid, and we'll get into that here in a couple slides. The other point I wanted to make is there is a difference between 50 hertz and 60 hertz when it comes to the motor on these pumps. So we have a lot of pumps. Some of our pumps are dual voltage, dual frequency. Uh, that means we can basically switch from 60 hertz to 50 hertz without changing too much with the system. Now, some of our systems, you'll see that uh, if you look at these systems, the last number in the product name, the 7010, 
The 10 refers to gallons per minute. So that's a 10 GPM system. Now that system, if I use the same pump and I run it at a lower frequency or at 50 hertz, I'm not sure, I think you guys are 50 hertz, but if I run it at 50 hertz, that system's only gonna run at 80% of the volume or the flow rate that we have at 60 hertz. So you'll run at eight GPM instead. Um, you'll just wanna check with us. Some of the systems we change the pump out completely because it's not a dual frequency, dual voltage pump, and some we use the same pump and you get a lower flow rate. So if you check with us and you'll, you'll start to figure it out as we move along. Okay, now we're gonna go through briefly this installation and setup and how these are supposed to be uh, integrated with your tank or your engine. So the basic setup, like I mentioned before, is the goal is to run the fluid along the bottom of the, of the tank, come up through a foot valve or a suction, a check valve, up through into the system, through the system, and then back down to the tank where you create this recirculation or a kidney loop type pattern. Now, that's gonna pick up all the sludge and water along the bottom and remove it from the system. The check valve or the foot valve we wanna have as low as possible in the tank, and that's gonna make sure that anything along that bottom goes into that foot valve. Now, a foot valve is basically a check valve, or it only allows fluid to go one direction. So basically, when this is full of fuel, this column stays full of fuel because the fuel can't go back through that valve. Now, up here, we have a priming tee, and that allows you to fill this column of fuel, or this column with fuel, before you start the system. We use gear pumps in these systems, which are positive displacement, meaning every time the pump turns, you're moving a positive amount of fuel with the pump. So this pump cannot run dry. So we wanna make sure this entire suction side line is primed or full of fuel before we start. So priming tea is basically a tea, you fill the fuel with the liquid, leave it full, and then you start the system. We always recommend flexible connections on both sides of the system. This keeps people from twisting the piping on the interior and creating additional leaks we don't need. So if you can install flexible connections on both sides and leave about a foot of, of uh, room between the system and any sidewall, so there's room for ventilation. Now, during installation, uh, we want to make sure that most of these systems are very level. If you can, keep them as level as possible. And that's because we use centrifugal separation on our pre-filter. Uh, we spin the fuel and the water as fast as possible, and the water is more dense or heavier, so it separates out and it fills this bowl with the, with the water. Uh, when this thing is at a different angle or it's tipping a little bit, this becomes less efficient and it becomes more of a problem. Now, these motors, uh, they're pretty quiet on this one, but this will vibrate, so we wanna make sure that you're mounting, uh, you use secure fastening nuts and then nothing happens. So use proper mounting. And then like I said, one, one foot is a good instance or a third of a meter uh, <laughs> to give yourself proper ventilation on both sides of the system. Now, we never recommend this, but if you have customers that wanna install one of these, so I guess I'll preface that with, if your customer is noticing problems on a fuel system and then the, this is typically how a lot of these sales come, is they won't get the system up front because they don't understand the problem. Um, they install their tank, they get their generator running, and all of a sudden, a year down the line, they find out they have bad fuel problems in the bottom of the tank. Now they're trying to find a solution and they want to install a maintenance system. Okay, well that's great, but they didn't design the tank to have enough fittings to install a maintenance system or they're not in the right location. So we have customers all the time that want to tie in with the existing lines on their gen set and tie their fuel polishing system in. Now we can do this and we do have customers that do this a lot, but you wanna be careful and you wanna do it the right way. You do not want this system to pull fuel from the engine. If you're gonna choke the engine and not give it enough fuel, uh, you're gonna obviously not burn well. On the same, on the discharge side, you also don't wanna to put too much back pressure on the engine. You could create uh, post combustion engine problems uh, on your injection system. So it's always important, install check valves on both lines, we don't want Basically check valve, just like a foot valve only allows fuel to go through one direction. So if this is pulling fuel, this system can't pull fuel from it. And inside all of our controllers, our PLC, PLC controllers, we also have emergency shutdowns, uh, 24 volt dry contacts. So what you can do is you can tie a uh, signal from the generator into our system. And no matter what you're in, manual mode, automatic, uh, you're on a seven day timer. If the engine turns on, we can turn this system off temporarily until the engine turns back off. So it'll pause its automated cycle and wait until that signal is gone and then this will resume its normal operation. So this is possible if you do get into the scenario and someone wants a uh, uh, install on an existing facility, uh, it would be good to contact us and just to have us take a look at it to make sure everything's okay. Now, another uh, thing we look at during installation, both on the discharge side and the suction side of our system is the size plumbing matters in a couple of different respects. One, uh, like I said, 
we oversize because of the vacuum capabilities of a pump. And two, if you think about how fast the fuel moves through these lines, the faster the fuel moves, the faster any ferrous or sand or particles move through the, through the piping, right? So if you look at flow rate, flow rate is a volume based calculation. So we have 10 GPM here and we have 10 GPM here. Now this is a one inch pipe internal diameter and this is three quarter. If you look at how fast the fuel is actually moving, it's the same flow rate, but the velocity of the fuel is different. So here we have 7.3 feet per second, here 4.1. So you can see that if you were to even neck this down and you went to half inch plumbing, uh, that fuel begins to move pretty fast. Now, as you encounter valves or elbows or different fittings in your plumbing, any particulate that's moving along with that fluid at this flow rate is gonna now hit the corner of that plumbing or hit the edge of that valve and you're gonna get much more wear in your entire fuel system in the plumbing. Uh, so it's important to recognize this fact. As an industry standard, we always recommend staying below 10 feet per second uh, in any piping. So you don't have to really do the calculation. Normally, if you follow the same plumbing size on our systems, you should be within that bound. You should be even a little lower than this. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, like I mentioned on that emergency shutdown, you're going to see that on all our systems on the wiring diagram. So if you find out which terminal block that comes from, you can tie your engine or whatever system you want into this shutdown. And as long as that shutdown has 24 volts, our system is in temporary hold until the 24 volts is released, and then it goes back into its automated schedule. Okay, now I'm going to go into the vacuum and system capabilities. And in all new presentations, I go into this uh, as deep as I can because it's important for our customers to understand. These are most of the calls we get. A customer will call and they'll wonder why they can't, uh, the system won't prime and the system won't run. So the first question we ask is, is it an underground or an above ground tank? If it's an underground tank, that means that pump has to pull the fuel from underneath the ground up into the system, okay? And that's where we start to hit issues. If it's too high of a pull, or they have too much plumbing, uh, the system vacuum capabilities are pushed and they don't work as well. So we'll get into that. Okay, so the first term I wanted to find is static head. Uh, you see this in fluid dynamics a lot when we look at uh, flow and head capabilities of a pump. So a pump pulls fuel in sort of and then pushes it out the other end. And I'll get into that more in a sec. But static head, when I use that term, I mean that from the top of the fluid, so basically the top of the fluid, not from how far your plumbing goes. Your plumbing can go all the way to the bottom of the tank. The static head is from the top of this right here to the center line of that pump. So normally we say that can't exceed 15 feet or basically five meters. I think I did that one right. A little less, maybe four and a half meters. Uh, but that's an important term to remember, static head. Especially, it's just on the suction side though. On the pressure side of a pump, if we want to push more, if you want to push 150 feet up a building, all you have to do is increase the motor size. So if we get a certain pump and we can push 20 feet and then that pump is done, if I add an extra three horsepower to the motor, now I can push 100 feet. So we can always upsize the motor on the pump. We can't, we can't change physics with the suction side. Okay, the other thing you wanna watch out for, so the pump first has to pull the fuel out of the tank to a certain height. That's gonna be a restriction on the suction side of that pump. The second thing you wanna watch out for is existing plumbing or any plumbing really, there's friction against the flow. So as you're pulling through that piping, if your piping is old and they have an older facility and it looks kind of like this, they're gonna have a much more difficult time on the suction side pulling through dirty piping. So that also has to do with how far are they pulling. If your customer has 150 feet in one direction and they turn and then they go 150 feet in a different direction and then down 10 feet, that's a lot of plumbing. That's probably not gonna work. And when I say that's not gonna work, I don't mean just for pumps in our systems, I mean for any pump anywhere. Uh, and I'll get, I'm gonna keep getting to that, but I'll drive it home. Now, valves also create restriction. Anything that's gonna create restriction is gonna be an issue on the suction side of a pump. So it's long pump runs, it's lifting a certain height, and it's also valves. They're not a straight pipe, they're not very smooth. A lot of valves you go through are gonna create more restriction on that pump. So depending on which valves you have in there, if you ever need us to do a calculation, we can kind of help you with understanding before you get to the site. The worst thing is you, you sell a system to a customer, he gets it on site, he does the install, he starts it up and he can't pull vacuum. Because what are your options at that point? Now you have to rip the system back out, you have to change the plumbing, uh, might be a lot of back charges on that side. Now the way a pump works, I said a pump will pull in one direction and then it pushes out the other side, okay? Really that's not what's happening. What a pump does when those gears spin is it creates a void or a vacuum, kind of like space. Okay, you have earth and then earth is holding all the air and the molecules down as close as it can with gravity. 
and so we have a certain pressure at the sea level. Uh, so you can imagine this as sea level pressure, 14.7 PSI or 101 kPa. And as you start to remove those molecules, you're creating a partial vacuum. And you can see here, we almost have a full vacuum. You, just, you have a void of molecules. But if I was to remove this wall and this wall, you can immediately see that all these molecules would make their way and they even themselves out. Now that's really what a pump is doing. It's creating a void at the pump inlet, and then the atmosphere pressure is actually pushing down the liquid and pushing the fuel into the pump. Now that brings up the case that as you go higher in the atmosphere, you can see that mountain climbers, people that climb Mount Everest or that way, Mount Everest, basically as they go up, they have less oxygen or the atmospheric pressure goes down. So you can see this curve here. As we go up in elevation, the pressure goes down in the atmosphere. So we have customers here in uh, Denver, mile high city we call it, a couple thousand meters. Basically what happens is they'll install a system thinking they have the same suction capabilities as someone at sea level. They get it installed and then they have vacuum issues. So you can see at a mile high or a couple thousand meters, you're almost down to 80% atmosphere at that point. That means you have 80% of suction capability you would at sea level. So I don't know if you guys get into the mountainous regions at all, but if you do have a customer that's higher elevation, keep this in mind um, if they have an underground tank. So another problem we look at on the suction side, and you don't really need to remember much about this. You may have heard about this before, uh, cavitation bubbles. So what happens is the pump is creating a vacuum and you're basically, imagine pulling the fuel apart uh, as far as you can. You're creating little voids uh, inside the fluid, right? So these little voids, as you pull, pull harder and harder on that fuel to get it into the pump, you're creating these mini voids. And now on a gear pump, as soon as those voids get to the suction side, the pump turns and they, the bubbles go through the pump and they end up on the pressure side. Now you have a pressure on those uh, bubbles and they collapse. So that collapsing process, it isn't smooth and usually you have a jetting that goes to the cavitation bubble. So the jetting, all of a sudden the bubble collapses and it jets into a surface. Now if that surface is on your gears, it may not hurt it the first, the second, the third time, but after thousands of these cavitation bubbles hit the surfaces of those gears, you get what's known as pitting. Now your gears aren't as tight when they lock or when they go through the motion to push fuel, and your pump begins to break down. So cavitation can occur on pumps, there's some valves that cavitation can hurt, but we put vacuum switches on our system so that we don't get to cavitation. So you'll see in our manuals, we shut down our pump or we shut the system down at 15 inches of mercury, um, I don't know if that is equivalent, basically seven PSI, or I can do the math. But what we want to avoid basically is too much cavitation on the pump. So if you get a system that's installed and the customer's having problems with the vacuum side, we can adjust our vacuum switch to let them get a little more, but we really want to avoid cavitation in the long term. You're going to really beat up that pump and it's not going to work forever. So just so you have an idea. Uh, now, like here, here I mentioned, you basically have atmospheric pressure pushing down on the fuel. You're creating a micro or a small vacuum here at the inlet of the pump, and the atmosphere is actually what's pushing the fuel into the pump. So now the pressure in your, or the vacuum or pressure in your line is less than that of the atmosphere because the atmosphere is doing the work. So whenever you see a vacuum gauge in any of our systems, you're going to see a negative reading because that's the pressure in the line minus the pressure in the atmosphere. So when we say 15 inches of mercury, it's usually negative. You'll see the gauge go opposite you will a pressure gauge. Okay, so that's just good to know. Now, here's where I really try to sink it home on the vacuum thing. Um, a lot of customers want to put a booster pump right in front of our system to overcome these vacuum capabilities. And it's not a problem with the pump or the system, it's a physics problem. Like I said, it's the atmosphere doing the work, so you can never pull more than the pressure of the atmosphere. So if you have one pump and you're, this is the wrong calculation by the way, but if you have a 15 foot height lift and you have suction problems and this pump can't pull this much, you can put as many pumps as you want in parallel, you still can't pull higher than that. You can put as many pumps in series as you want, you still can't pull more than that height. It's a physics problem, not a pumping problem. So if you do, like I said, have customers or a site plan and you want us to investigate uh, for the customer or for yourself to make sure that system's gonna work, you can just drop us an email or a line and we can go through the actual calculations to make sure that that system will work once installed. Now I'm gonna run through the controller real quick just so you get an idea of what we're talking about and the different options. So this is a picture of the touchscreen controller that's on a 7,000 series system. So the 6,000 series and the 7,000 series, the filtration and everything is exactly the same. Uh, you upgrade the controller because you wanna have the touchscreen capability. 
or because you want someone to be able to connect into their building management system, their SCADA system. The 7000 series has Ethernet, um, RS-232, 485. So we have a few different communication protocols that we can do, uh, and that's normally why they upgrade. Now, it's a much more expensive process. If your customer wants to upgrade later, if they buy a 6000 series and later on they decide they want to put a communication system in, uh, it's better to sell them the 7000 originally if they ever have plans to upgrade than it is to sell them a 6 and then try to convert it to a 7. All the wire needs to come out, the controller needs to be removed completely. It's an entire different PLC. So much better if they ever have plans to try to sell them on this. And you can see here we have, this is the screen you're gonna program these on. So you can see three timers per day and then you can switch between the days. It's a seven day timer. So you pick the day, you pick the hours in military format and you can set three as long as they don't overlap, three different timers for each day. Uh, the two things you wanna make sure, ensure the date is correct We've had this happen where they can't find out why it's running the wrong time and make sure the time is correct. So, uh, This is the inside of the 6000 series controller. So you can see this one isn't uh, touch screen. You have a small viewing window here. This is gonna alert you what the alarms are, but they're also gonna be on the exterior of the system. So the lights will show you what alarm is and you can check again here if you want. But this is the main PLC module. We have a power module, two breakers, basically the circuit breaker on the right or closest to the PLC is always for the 24 volt power, and then the far one is for the motor power or the, the high voltage. Now I'm gonna run through the system specifications. Like I said, all this information is available to you, so if you wanna do additional research, um, this part becomes a little monotonous, a little redundant if I go through all the specifications of every system. So the smallest system in the STS line is the 6000 SXF. This one is only available with the 6000 controller, so you won't see this in a 7000. This system was designed to be small, to fit in certain areas, so there's no room in here to upgrade to the uh, touchscreen. This one's around nine and a half liters per minute, the third internal gear pump, uh, all stainless steel internal plumbing. We've got a fine filter here, you've got the fuel conditioner, and then we've got the water separator and uh, SEPAR pre-filter. Now, I didn't mention this yet, but these pre-filters, the fuel comes in here through the main line and immediately goes down, where it's centrifugally spun, separating the water and the fuel and any heavy particulate. Uh, that particulate water collects in this bowl and the fuel continues up the path back out. There's also a filter in here and that's a hydrophobic filter that's uh, typically 30 or 10 microns. That filter blocks water from continuing up the flow. So once water comes in here, if any of it is still trying to move with the fuel, it gets blocked as does any particulate of that size. So this is a really good pre-filter to remove 99.9% .9 of your water and any of the particulate to protect the gears in this pump. Uh, you can see we have options of audible stack lights. Since all the controls are on the inside here, if the alarm goes off, the, you can get an audible or a visual beacon here. That's gonna allow you to basically see there's something wrong with the system, someone opens up the door and they can check both on the screen and the alarm light. The 7004, this is the first one, the 6000, 7004. This is the first system that's available with the controller upgrade. So you can see here, this is the 6000 version. If you get the seven, you get a touch screen on this controller. Uh, you get the ethernet capability, uh, basically right here. Now, this system, uh, about 15 liters per minute, but you've got the same type of components, just larger. We've got this pre-filter to remove water and uh, large particulate through the pump, through the conditioner, and through the fine filter. Uh, and then this one has a flow meter. Uh, the flow meter is basically just ensuring that the system has flow and that we don't have any problems. This is kind of redundant to the pressure switch. If you get a high pressure, Normally, you're probably not going to have very good flow, so this may go off as well, too. Uh, here's an option you can see in this one. I'll get to this at the end, but this is a heater option. In colder climates, if you can keep a, a few degree difference between the internal temperature of the cabinet and the external, then you can keep condensation from forming on the electronics and all the internal components. Uh, this little module you're going to see on all the systems, this is a Watek water detection module. That unit can detect the difference between the conductivity of water and the conductivity of diesel. So there's two contacts on the bottom of these bowls, and when water builds up in these bowls and it reaches the contacts, this can detect the water is up to that level, send the PLC a signal, and it shuts the system down. That's when it's time for someone to come out and drain that unit. So that will detect those to last for a long time, and no one really has any problems with those. Uh, all the filtration options are listed here, but we have a filter replacement chart as well. Um, most of them are the same options for this and this in terms of efficiency and uh, water blocking ability. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the items, but 
This is something you can reference in your own time. Uh, this is a float switch in the bottom. This is basically a small reed switch. So if anything inside this cabinet leaks and it drips into this basin, as soon as that switch moves up very slightly, uh, it shuts the whole system down and we send a leak signal alarm. So that someone comes out and tries to fix it. Besides that, for alarms, we have a vacuum switch here. The vacuum switch is gonna shut down. It's gonna see the clogness of this filter. So as this filter clogs, the, the vacuum rises and rises next to the pump. And all of a sudden, when it gets to a certain level, we shut down so it doesn't cavitate. That just means it's time for someone to come out and check this filter. Same thing here, we have a pressure switch. This pressure switch sees any restriction in the plumbing as you move this way. So if there's a clogged filter or there's something stuck in the line, this pressure switch is gonna shut down at around 22 PSI. The flow switch as well, it's a flow alarm. So if there's for some reason there's no flow moving through this, we also shut the system down so that no one gets hurt and nothing gets explodes. That's uh, a safety mechanism. And then like I mentioned, the float and the water contact. So five basic alarms on these systems. Uh, now I'm gonna move through a little faster because these systems are very similar. It goes through the, the large product line. Uh, and as they get bigger, the flow rate goes up. You can see 10 GPM or 38 GP, uh, LP8, LPM, not GPM. And basically we increase uh, filter capacity and larger filters, but same overall concept. We use the same alarm capability. You have the ability for both upgrades, the system enclosure gets bigger and the weight gets heavier. So again, these are available on all spec sheets if you need to take a look. What you're seeing here is an auto water drain option. I will get to this at the end, but it's in this model, so I figured I'd mention it. This is an even larger system. This is a 30 gallon per minute or 113 LPM, both controller upgrades. Uh, at this flow rate, we move to a different type of filter uh, because these are good for this flow rate. Uh, we can explain that in more detail. Same thing, basically going through it all again. This one is the largest system we have in the STS product line. This is the 40 GPM or 151 LPM. Both controllers available. Here we have a strainer with a water separator through the pump, fuel conditioner, and then two levels of filtration again on the backside. So. Same thing again, you guys can look through this on your own. Uh, now I'm gonna run through the alarms and commissioning. I think this is an important thing to bring up because on the sales side of this, you sell a system and you make the money selling the system to the customer. You also want to set up the installation if you have the capability. You sell them the installation of the system, then you sell them the commissioning of the system. So basically the commissioning, we want to make sure that the system's functioning, everything works, and that it's integrated right into the facility. Uh, those are three revenue lines that you can add onto a, a, a system sale. You can also add it to your PM contract. So if you want to set up a, a system where they, they get commissioning every six months, you go out, you check all the alarms, make sure the system's still running, you make sure their filters are good. Uh, that's something you can also add to your product line. If you want to time it with the PM service on the gen sets, uh, that's a good way that we have a lot of engine dealers uh, get a little extra revenue. So high vacuum alarm, you want to make sure, we talked about high vacuum, we don't want to cavitate, we want to know when this filter is clogged, so we use the vacuum switch. Now in the field, if a vacuum switch goes off, you basically get this alarm here, so high vacuum alert. Uh, in the field, 99.9% .9 of the time, if this vacuum switch goes off, this filter is clogged. They open the top of it, they break the vacuum, and they clean or replace this filter. Now this filter, the SEPAR filters, don't throw them away every time. They can back flush this filter, pour clean diesel through the filter, and you can use it up to three to four times. So, nope, go back. So basically that's how, uh, if in the field, if the vacuum switch goes off, check the filter. If it's not the filter and they replace the filter and it's still, uh, you're seeing a high vacuum alarm, now you wanna start checking the rest of the line down to the tank, okay? Anything that's in this line is it could set off that vacuum switch. If it's not the filter, this ball valve could be closed. Your priming tee may be stuck with some gunk. The foot valve could be stuck or something could have got stuck in the line. So after checking the filter, you go through basically a diagnostic step. You're into troubleshooting at that point. It's not the filter, it could be something else. Now for commissioning, when you do the commissioning on these systems, you basically want to ensure that this switch works and that it goes off at the right vacuum. So you'll want to watch the gauge on top of the set bar and you'll want to basically turn the system on in manual mode, uh, start it up, get the system running, let it run for 20 seconds, make sure everything's fine. This ball valve here at the entrance of the system, you want to slowly close it and you're going to see this gauge start to go up or start to turn counterclockwise. Uh, as that turns, if you, if you do it slow enough, you can find the point which the system shuts down and you want to make sure that that matches up with what's in your manual. So if we say it shuts down at 12 inches of mercury, you want to make sure that this switch shut the system down at 12 inches of mercury. And if you have a deviation from that, you want to contact us and find out why. 
we can field adjust those if we need to. Um, usually they're preset from the factory with no problems. So that's, you've just commissioned the alarm, the vacuum alarm, you've made sure the switch works and it shuts down at the right vacuum. Now the same thing can be done for the pressure switch. So if you come over here and you get a exterior light that says high pressure alarm, 99.9% .9 of the times it's this filter that's clogged. This is, that's the point of this switch. When this switch sees a high pressure because this is clogging the line, it's gonna shut the system down. So in the field, if you change this filter and you're still getting a high pressure alarm, now it's time to go into troubleshooting mode. Is it the magnet? Is it clogged in the ferrous particles? Is the flow switch stuck? Is the ball valve uh, completely closed? Did someone shut it by accident? Is there something stuck in the remainder of the line back to the tank? Now you're in troubleshooting mode and you want to find out why that switch went off. So for commissioning of this alarm, basically like the vacuum switch, you want to make sure that the switch goes off and then it goes off at the right pressure. So when you get the system up and running again, get it into manual. You want to watch this pressure switch. We've got color code indicators on here. So green is proper operating range for the, uh, the filter. Red means that you're past the filter capacity and the system should shut down. So start the system up in manual mode, slowly close this ball valve at the exit. Uh, keep in mind, there's locking mechanisms on these ball valves. You may have to just pull the tab slightly to get the ball valve to turn. But slowly turn the ball valve and watch this gauge. Now, as this gauge goes up, you want to make sure that when the system shuts down from the pressure switch, it shuts down right as it hits the red. That means you're shutting down at the proper, uh, the proper pressure and that the switch actually works. So now you've just commissioned the high pressure alarm. You've got two down so far. And as you can see, we're moving our way across the lights in the front of the enclosure here. This third one is the uh, flow switch. So you can see the flow switch right here. The flow switch is a Y-type flow switch on this particular system. Uh, in the manual, if there's any deviations, you can see the difference between the flow switches. So you'll want to get the system up and running, make sure all ball valves are open again, get it up and running in manual mode. And you, this flow switch has a, basically a knob that'll turn. And on the flow switch itself, you can see the flow rate indicators. So when it leaves the factory, it's set for the flow rate that you're gonna want in the field of this system. And the flow switch is looking for a deviation from that flow rate. So if you spin it all the way down and it's seeing too low of a flow rate, uh, the system will alarm and shut down. Also, if you go too high, the system will shut down because you're deviating from that bound. Now, there's a 10 second delay in this flow switch and that's used basically to get the system up and running. When you first start the system and there's only air in the pressure side, we want to give 10 seconds to establish flow so we don't shut down inadvertently from a bunch of uh, high or no flow alarms. So to test this in the field, there's a small light that comes on on this switch. Now when that light, when that switch sees flow, that light is on. When that light goes off, the system does not see flow. So what you want to do is start the system up in manual and loosen this little cap here and you'll just twist it in either direction. Uh, it would be better to go out. So turn it up to 10 GPM. The system's flowing at four GPM. It's not gonna see the right flow rate. The light is gonna turn off and then 10 seconds later, the system's gonna shut down. So now you've just commissioned and made sure that your flow switch works within this system. Uh, the next one as we move across the alarm panel is the leak switch. Um, with the PLC, we have two dry contacts that you can tie into existing uh, your facility, uh, 24 volt. One is for a summary alarm that's going to tell you if any of these faults go off, and the other one is the leak switch alarm. Now, the leak switch is a little different than the rest of these. The other ones basically mean that your system needs service. Someone needs to come out and change a filter or check the system. If this one goes off, that means someone needs to get out there right away because you have a leak within the system. That means this pan is full of fuel now and you want to shut down and make sure everything's okay. Uh, to test this one, this is very easy. Get the system running in manual mode, make sure you're flowing. All you gotta do is put your hand under there and lift up the float switch. Immediately as soon as that float switch is lifted, it goes off, the system shuts down. Um, you've commissioned the float switch at that point. The last one, go to the next one. The next one is the water in the bowl. Um, on the main system, you can see it's the last alarm here, high water alarm. That just means that this bowl, this sump or your pre-filter has filled to a certain level, you've got water up to here and it's time to drain it. So there's two probes here on the system that tie back into this module, that tie back into the PLC. So in the event that uh, this fills with water, it shuts down automatically, someone comes out and drains it. If you're commissioning the system, you get it started in manual. Now these are conductive, there's no high voltage, no danger or risk here. Uh, what you can do is you can take your finger or a screwdriver and basically put it across these two terminals while you're running. It's gonna detect, detect your finger and your finger has the same conductivity or closer conductivity to water than it does diesel. 
So the system will shut down and you just basically commission the uh, high water alarm. And you're basically done the commissioning at that point. So you have just commissioned your system and you can charge the customer uh, whatever you whatever you feel uh, necessary in that region. Uh, I'm going to run through some system options at this point now. These are things that you can get the, system, the customer to buy on. Uh, it may help them budgetary or it may just be something they're looking for within the specification. So options, filters are an option on every system. There isn't just one standard filter. Uh, I go through this in Diesel 101, but basically the things you want to watch out for in a filter are uh, it's either beta ratio or the efficiency. They're both the same thing. They mean the same thing. It's just different ways of calculating uh, how efficient it is. So it's one thing to say you have a three micron filter. It's another thing to say you have a three micron filter at 98% efficient. They could be completely different things. If you don't see an efficiency, normally they don't want to advertise it because it's not good enough to represent. So we always, rep we always at least give you the number uh, efficiency or beta and the, um, the micron so you have an idea of what you're getting. Uh, and this again, now I've mentioned in MTC systems and STS systems, the difference between them and why you might use an MTC to clean up instead of using an STS. And that's because we use nominal filters or low efficiency and high efficiency in an MTC. So you can see here that if these filters both have an average pore size of three microns, this is a much better filter, but it also means that this filter is much more expensive because of the way it's manufactured. This one still has its place though. We still use nominal filters because you can use a nominal filter to clean up a lot of the sludge and the large particulate without spending the money of the absolutes. These bag filters is a nominal filter. These bag filters are six to $7 while these could be 30 to 40. So if you can use these to get most of the sludge and the grime out uh, and then switch over to these to get to a very clean fuel, it's the most economical way. So this relates back to efficiency of the filter in a certain micron, so keep that in mind. Uh, you can see here, this is available for you. We have filter replacement charts. They're going to give you the filters for the spin-ons and the uh, pre-filters so you can, you can tell what you need and what system they go on. Uh, and then on the 30 GPM system, again, we just have different options for a different type of filter, still high efficiency. Now, another option you can get if your customer doesn't want to put a system on every tank, they can get a multi-tank system. Now, we always recommend against multi-tanks in mission critical applications. So if you have a hospital and they have 10 tanks and you put one system that runs four tanks and another system that runs four tanks and one that runs two, if you lose that system or the system goes down for some reason, now you've lost four tanks. So in mission critical applications, we'd rather want run one system per tank, but if your customer has budgetary issues, we can also do multi-tank systems. So in a multi-tank system, here we use L-port ball valves, or there's three ports on the ball valve, and an actuator. And that actuator turns it as the system needs to. So in a multi-port system, basically the uh, controller, you're going to set that up to run on two different tanks at two different uh, run rates, run times, and it will automatically switch the valves to each tank when that tank is ready to run. Uh, and then I've removed the piping here for the other side of this, but you can imagine these going back to the tanks. On three tanks or more, we don't use L-port ball valves. We use actuated ball valves still, but they're straight through. Uh, what happens is with the L-ports, we can put those right on the edge of the system and ship it. Uh, when you get three valves or more, it's much more difficult. So we have you guys manifold those in the field. We give you hookups that you plug in. You install the valves and you check them on site, um, but they should be factory tested. Now, we use actuated ball valves instead of solenoids uh, for two reasons. Solenoid valves are more restrictive. so Again, they're going to hurt the suction capability and the pressure capability of the pump. And with actuated ball valves, you get a feedback signal. So it's not just a run signal to open the valve. With an actuated ball valve, we send a signal to close, a signal to open, and then when you get to open, it sends a signal back to the PLC saying, I'm open. Or when it closes, it sends a signal back that says, I'm closed. And what that's going to do is that's going to let you know the valve position at any time. So there's no way that you can have a valve that's in the field open and no one knows about it. Uh, that's important because when you have multiple tanks and these multi-tank systems set up, if you're transferring from one tank to another, you can see how you might overfill and have a, a kind of an emergency, environmental emergency. So this is a much safer option. These also have a small heater inside too, so the condensation doesn't build up on the electronics. So they're just a better overall valve, a little more pricey, but I think it's worth it. Uh, stainless steel is an option. Now, all of our systems, the blue cabinets, they are uh, phosphatized services and then they're powder coated. It's a very, very thick powder coat. Uh, we never really have any options with rust or any breakdown. 
If your customer is very worried and they want to go stainless, we can do 304 or 316. These are much more expensive, uh, but it is an option that we have available for all size cabinets. Now, the auto water drain, like I mentioned, normal systems, when this bowl fills with water to a certain level, someone has to come out and they have to manually drain that ball valve or that little ball valve on the bottom of the filter. Uh, in the auto water drain system, instead of using two contacts that are horizontal, we use two sets of contacts. So you can see that as the water rises in here and it reaches that top set of contacts, the system shuts down and waits for a minute so the water can separate, and then it drains this, the water holding uh, sump here back down to the lower set of contacts. It uses a small pump and a little strainer and it drains out into an existing barrel. Uh, this is 15 gallons, typically 57 liters. And when this barrel fills up, we have a float switch in the top that will also shut the system down so someone has to come out and change this barrel. So you can get hundreds of fills in this barrel. So basically no one will have to come out on site and service this all the time. But you can see in this system we have two of these Wattec modules because each one is reading a set of contacts. So that's just another option that's pretty popular here in the US. Uh, and that's really the end of the STS one. Like I said, we wanted you guys to be the guinea pigs for this. We wanted to give you an idea um, of our capabilities. So if you have questions on a certain system or you want to get a little more in depth, we can put up an entire presentation or we can zoom in on certain components and explain a little in better detail. Um, I know this is a little more technical, but I wanted you guys to see a couple of different avenues to make additional revenue. So you've got the system sale, you've got the commissioning of the system and the installation, and then you've got the PM contract that you can tie back in to the engine you already have. So it's, a, it's an easy way to make money on the STS system. You know how you can make money on the MTC systems. If they don't want to go with a stationary system, they can get someone to come out like you to do the service contract and you guys can make revenue that way. Went on being real quick. All right, so do you guys have any questions or any comments? Uh, thanks for being our first one. I want to thank you guys. Um, I hope it went well. I hope all the graphic is well. We're still working on this, but uh, I think it's going to be good in the future. Yeah, no, thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, I think just one quick question. Um, sure. you, you mentioned something uh, with regards to floor rate at 60 and Yeah. Yes. Um, can we just go over that once more? One more time? Can you turn it off? So it was the difference between 60 and 50 hertz. What was the question? Yeah, you, you mentioned something about um, the flow rate. The flow rate yes, at, 50 hertz, at 50 hertz versus at 60 hertz. And yep. if I recall well, it went down to about 20 percent loss on the rate. Is that so? Uh, so I'm not. Our volume is pretty low in this sense, our guys. <laughs> the flow rate yep. at 60 hertz versus the flow rate at 50 hertz. You yep. mentioned something about a drop between the two. Yes. Uh, so. Yep. As, a rough, as a rough calculation, it worked out to about a 50%, a 20% drop. 20%, yep. 20% at 50 versus at 60. Yep, 20% drop from 60 hertz back to 50 hertz. Okay. So if it's a 10 GPM, it goes to 8, so you can, you can figure that part out. Uh, some of the systems have that. Some of the systems, we actually switch out the pump and motor for one that's made for 50 hertz. So just check with us before buying a system, and we'll let you know uh, which one it is. All right. Okay. All right. No, it answers my question. Thank you. No problem. Do you guys, uh, any other questions or any comments or anything? No, apart from the last request we made from the marketing point of view, have you given some thought with regards to either consignment stock units or units that we can get on a long-term payment basis? Uh, we're going to have to sit down. I know Mike has mentioned that to me about setting you guys up with some kind of consignment plan. I uh, will have to go back and talk on that one and I'll, I'll follow up with you guys on that one. Okay. We'll work on that. No, I think, um, I think we're pretty clear. Okay. And it was pretty informative and straightforward. Okay. Um, however, can we request that we make this on a by Friday basis? Or, yeah. yeah, by Friday starting off. And, um, that's kind of the purpose of this one. We wanted to show you guys our capability so that if you wanted us to help you with the sale and it was a good customer, we would be there for that. Okay. Right. Other than that, we're good. Okay. All right, guys, I appreciate you coming in or coming in, I guess, viewing in. Um, if you need to do more, you want to do another presentation, just let Mike know and we'll set up another time. Thanks for being our guinea pig. I appreciate it and uh, have a good day.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.